Inside Outside Innovation is the podcast that brings you the best and the brightest in the world of startups and innovation. I'm your host, Brian Ardinger, founder of InsideOutside.io, a provider of research, events, and consulting services that help innovators and entrepreneurs build better products, launch new ideas, and compete in a world of change and disruption. Each week, we'll give you a front row seat to the latest thinking, tools, tactics, and trends in collaborative innovation. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. I'm your host, Brian Ardinger. And as always, we have another amazing guest. Today with me is Sean Johnson. Sean is a partner at Digital Intent, which is an innovation consulting firm. He's also a general partner at Founder Equity, an early stage venture fund. He also teaches at Kellogg and all around great guy. Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for coming on board. Yeah. One reason why I wanted to have you on the show, because you kind of preach the inside outside methodology of innovation and building new products, whether it's within a corporate environment or a startup environment, you've got a lot of hands-on experience with that. So I wanted to have you on the show to talk a little bit about that. To update our audience a little bit about how you got into this space, why don't you tell us a little bit about digital intent and kind of your path to getting on on the space of innovation? Our background was we were startup guys. I've got two other partners. We cut our teeth kind of working inside of startups. My partner, Joe, was a kind of a multiple-time CEO. I was always sort of in a head of product type of role. And then my other partner, Matt, was uh, head of technology. So we had a nice kind of synergy there in terms of our skill sets. And we kind of got a little burned out with the sort of the startup meat grinder a little bit. And, you know, candidly, we started having kids and it was sleeping under a desk and doing all of that used to be more fun when we were 25. (laughs) But, you know, we saw we had a certain skill set that we thought would be helpful for people. And so we initially started working with startups and filling gaps for them. So if they were really strong technically, but maybe they lacked some of the user experience or some of the product strategy skills, we'd help out there and vice versa. Maybe they lacked kind of rigorous thinking around kind of testing pricing. In a lot of cases, and this was back before Lean Startup was really popular, we just called it talking to people. Surprising to us early on, you know, how rarely they would actually go and stress test their idea with customers and they would immediately go from kind of a back of a napkin to like, let's build the thing. And we were like, hold on guys, let's let's slow down a little bit. So that's what we were doing for a long time. And then, you know, as you know, these enterprise companies started standing up these innovation groups and they started sort of approaching us saying, hey, we have the same kinds of problems that these startups do in the sense that we are business people, great analytical skills, super deep domain expertise, but what we're lacking is the ability, once we've kind of identified an idea that's potentially worth pursuing, we lack access to some of the resources. They have those resources, they have engineers, they have designers, but getting, getting their time was really difficult. And then secondly, sort of a methodology or a philosophy that I'm sure you're aware, they're great at execution of an existing business model, but right. taking small bets, being iterative, doing all of that kind of stuff is a little bit outside of still uh, a lot of organizations sort of comfort zones are getting a lot better, but it's still an issue for them. And so that is sort of long story short, kind of how we got to where we are now. And today, you know, we'll still work with some startups. They tend to be more venture backed these days, but the bulk of our revenue comes from some of these larger kind of Fortune 1000 companies that are looking to either they have an idea and they want to execute on it, or they're saying, Hey, we want to become a tech enabled company and we don't necessarily know how to do that. Can you help us in getting kind of a little bit earlier? It's similar to the background that I took as far as working with startups and now doing a lot more corporate innovation stuff. But in some of the things that you mentioned earlier, I kind of want to dig into as far as mm-hmm. the differences between what it's like for a startup to spin up a new idea versus a corporate innovation group. What's the biggest mistake that you commonly see with corporations trying to think and act and move more like a startup? I'll be totally honest. And it's a challenge that we're not incredible yet at overcoming for them. And it's the idea of putting all their eggs kind of in one basket. So they stand up this group. They, they start doing some internal hackathons or open innovation type of initiatives or whatever. There's still often a very high sort of tolerance for risk. And what ends up happening is they green light an idea and they put a lot of resources behind that idea. And then if it doesn't work out, they're like, see, we're not good at innovation, right? And I knew it. knew we wouldn't be able to do it. And our argument to them is you should be thinking, you know, I'm a partner at a venture fund as well. What we advocate to them is you should be thinking like a venture fund. You should be saying, hey, this is a fund that we are raising and the plan is to allocate those funds across a portfolio of initiatives, call it 10, call it 20, whatever it is, and use you know similar kinds of stage gate sort of milestone-based mechanisms that are baked into the venture process sort of inherently 
where it's, you know, hey, we're going to give you some quote unquote seed capital. That's going to be enough for you to take it a certain distance. And then we're going to evaluate it and say, do we want to put more resources into that? And you fully expect that the majority of those are not going to, you know, make it all the way through the funnel. But the couple that will, will effectively return your fund. And so that's something that we advocate for. It's really difficult, candidly, to get organizations to sort of think that way. I think to them, it sounds like when you're already sort of risk averse, I think it sounds like risk and it sounds like a lot of thrashing. And to a certain extent, that's true. It is a fair amount of thrashing, but it's thrashing early and it's killing things early versus putting two years. You know, we had a client that was telling us that innovation for them looked like uh, five years. And eight million dollars into an initiative, yeah. and at the end of it, they didn't really have a whole lot to show for it. So, we try to get them to think like investors and understand that you're you're going to make mistakes. And if you think that just because you have that domain expertise, that you're going to you know you're going to bat a thousand when you're with these initiatives, it's craziness. I mean, we've had to learn it the hard way as VCs, in spite of all of the diligence that you do and all of the brain power that you think that you're throwing to it. You have no idea at the outset which one of those companies is going to make it or not. And so having a little bit of humility and spreading risk across a variety of initiatives would be kind of the main thing that I would try to focus on. Absolutely. And I think the other thing that kind of comes into play is you think about even if they want to go down that particular path and they decide that they're going to be thinking and acting more like a venture capital person and deploying capital Mm -hmm. across multiple projects, they don't necessarily have the teams or enough of the teams (laughs) and execute on that. So just thinking through like you have to be able to put fair number of these ideas through a process over time. And if you have two people in your lab that are designed to put those 20 ideas through in a year, it's going to be challenging that way as well. Yeah, it is. And there's things that they can do to sort of minimize it a bit. One of the ideas around everybody's heard of kind of the minimum viable product, but I think there's a lot of disagreement around what what constitutes minimal. Even Eric Reese says that, you know, it can be a lot more minimal than you think. We'll advocate when you're in a resource constrained situation or even when you're not, Why not take a page from Amazon and start with that press release, right? It's much easier to iterate on that than it is to iterate on designs, much less working software. And get that in front of customers and do the same thing kind of with your prototypes. We found areas it becomes a little bit difficult is with that prototyping phase when you show it to customers. In a lot of cases, they're not used to seeing interfaces like that, you know, low fidelity, Mm -hmm. kind of rough. It can sometimes be really hard for them to step outside of I'm not looking at a finished product right now and give you kind of directional feedback that way, which is why we advocate in a resource constrained situation like that, like do sketches, like show them nobody mistakes, (laughs) you know, pencil marks on a piece of paper. So there are things that people can do to accelerate that a little bit, but yeah, you're right. It can definitely be a challenge when you're trying to vet 20 different ideas and you've got a team of two that can be tough. I mean, the other thing though is we assume an average life of a fund being seven to 10 years. Right. right. And I think we've averaged three deals a year in terms of what we actually invest in. And we obviously look at a lot more than that. You can have a similar cadence. Right? And it doesn't necessarily mean that all 20 of those ideas have to be executed on immediately. I think, candidly, the challenge there for innovation groups relates to team churn and yeah. issues around is this person going to be around long enough to get enough reps to kind of find a winner? And if not, can we preserve sort of the institutional knowledge that they've accumulated? And can we pass that sort of down? But that's where we know that all three of the GPs and even you know our analysts and everybody are going to are going to be with us for the life of the fund. That's a real advantage that I think a lot of innovation teams probably don't have. But yeah, it is tricky. Corporations tend to have customers. <laughs> that's why they're yeah. corporations. And, and yeah. so getting close to that customer sometimes can be a challenge because they think they know that customer or they've been serving yeah. them in a certain particular way for a long time where a startup doesn't necessarily have that baggage around it, both, yeah. you know, from brand or everything else. So talk a little bit about what you've seen or, or the challenges that can have by having quote unquote legacy customers that you have to create new things for. You're right. Another issue is brand risk or the perception yeah. that there's brand risk. So getting, and, and you'll usually feel this with, you know, with more marketing teams or you have the biz dev or whatever the folks that tend to be closest to the customer sometimes are clutching to those relationships and anything that they show those people, they kind of want to be relatively polished and their willingness, if they have a great relationship with a client, getting beta or pilot customers sometimes can still be a challenge sort of internally from a politics perspective, just because they feel like if that pilot doesn't go well, it's going to, there's risk that it'll harm that relationship. That can definitely be tough. One way to sort of mitigate that a little bit is, 
and this this is a kind of a broad theme around these innovation groups in general, is don't wait to get those people involved. And they don't have to be involved as an embedded part of the team, but letting them know that this is what we're working on, trying to have those conversations with them early on when we're saying, hey, we're standing this up. This is sort of our mandate. Let's talk about who, who some of our customers are that maybe are a little more forward thinking. We think maybe would be the sort of early evangelists that are willing to kind of put up with some kludginess or some Wizard of Oz type of concierge sort of MVPs, all of that kind of stuff, but get them involved earlier so that they get to provide input and they get to put their stamp on it. And now it's their initiative too, right? right. Versus waiting and then springing it on them and saying, hey, we got this finished product. We want to go show it to some people and having them say, no, 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 uh, hold on. Yeah, have you seen much success using off-brand techniques or non-branded techniques? Yes, and it sort of depends on the nature of the product. Something that we sometimes suggest that is standing up sort of a faceless brand, seeing can you get legs with it without leveraging those brand assets, right? Like you have this things that you think are going to be an advantage. You're concerned about brand risk. Going out there cold and acting as though you're basically a startup that doesn't have any of those sort of advantages can help you cut through a little bit of it because you can say, all right, well, what happens? Because for one thing, what happens once we exhaust that Rolodex and we need to kind of go out to that next layer, you're going to have to do that eventually anyway. This can be a way to sort of mitigate that. It can be a way to kind of, kind of again, get people out of the building where you'll get more realistic feedback. If I have a really great relationship with you and we have a long-term kind of account with you, that might cloud your ability to give me the kind of radical candor that I need to kind of vet this idea. Right. And you may so, get a lot of early um, adopter. You may get a lot of early adopters that because they're your existing customers, will give it a try, but it may not actually be a clear signal. Yeah, we're dealing with that with a client right now. They're trying to white label a product that previously kind of a, a consumer facing product, and they do have existing relationships with a bunch of people, and they're very nervous about trying to go and sell it to folks that are cold. And that's understandable. I mean, again, it comes back to the mindset of the people that are kind of working in these groups. If this were a startup and it didn't have the benefit of that, the people that are that are running point on it in order for it to be successful have got to be, the hustle gene has got to be there. There has to be a, a, a degree of sort of shamelessness, a degree of passion where it's like, I'm going to knock down whatever doors I need to knock down and make this thing happen. That mindset is often not sort of resident inside of those teams. And so, they're nervous about kind of going up to people cold and trying to get them to kind of try something. And so the safety blanket of kind of leveraging existing client relationships is intoxicating. But yeah, I think there are definitely some advantages to kind of trying to do it off brand. Are you seeing any models or any opportunities partnering with startups or corporations? Cause they don't necessarily have the talent or the quote unquote yeah. entrepreneurs within their organization. Although I tend to say that there are some folks that are trapped in their cubicle waiting to get out. But yeah. in general, have you seen any models or things where, reaching outside to startups or to startup talent execute on some of this stuff and beneficial? Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of where they're bringing in like an EIR to help mm -hmm. execute. You do see a lot of, you know, sort of partnership arrangements where maybe they'll, they, they've been exploring an idea and they're trying to make a build versus buy decision. And a real low risk way to kind of do that is to, is to partner with an existing startup that already has some traction, existing relationships and all of that kind of thing. And it's one of those areas where I, Wearing the multiple hats that I sort of wear, I can tie myself in knots about it because from a startup's perspective, it's very much a double-edged sword, right? Like Absolutely. on the one hand, you're getting access to a distribution channel that maybe you couldn't have. That often can be an entree to an acquisition. On the other hand, the amount of resources and concentration risk that it can present where you're having to kind of modify or retrofit what it is that you're doing to appease this monolith can be a big distraction. And if it doesn't end up working out, it can be a big problem for you. And you've dedicated so many of those resources to that, hoping that that thing was going to work out, that when it doesn't, you're now staring down the barrel of trying to make progress in ways that you had been, been neglecting because you put so many of your eggs in that basket. From a startup perspective, it's something, you know, when we have one of our fun companies is exploring a pilot partnership in retail, or like a 40 store pilot. And we're trying to help them sort of navigate that. And that's one of the pieces of advice is just sort of be very measured about this. Assume it's not going to work out. Do your best to kind of execute on it and knock it out of the park. But understand this is not this magic pill that you're going to take. From a startup's perspective, it's very much a double-edged sword. But from an enterprise perspective, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think the risk from an enterprise perspective is 
recognizing what it is that makes that startup successful, sort of their secret sauce. A lot of times there are things that are sort of the inherent advantages of the startup or sort of the antithesis of big co. Just be careful in how much you're forcing them to kind of adjust their behavior to fit your sort of way of doing things and try to figure out kind of that right balance of having a partnership that's sort of the symbiotic as possible where you're not cutting off their legs in the process and mitigating their effectiveness. Yeah, the more it becomes a professional development type of cycle versus a product cycle for anybody in that particular industry struggling yeah. struggling with that problem, the, the more challenging yeah. it becomes. Your so, point about the EIR thing is a great one. I mean, I think if more corporations could do that, I think it would be fantastic. I think the challenge there is that an EIR is typically somebody who's had some success in startup world and has had some liquidity, and there are often identity issues yes. kind of associated with that. And they think of themselves as a startup person, and it can be a challenge sometimes, I think, to kind of recruit those folks onto those teams. But I think that if you can pull that off, I think that's a great uh, way to sort of jumpstart your effort, just because you have somebody who doesn't have any sort of the legacy baggage, be informed by your domain expertise, but has that sort of that hustle gene and some of those competencies that are predicted yeah. to success. At the end of the day, as a corporation, if you're not creating talent, giving your existing talent some of the same skill sets that are required in today's business world, where, you know, the idea of being more adaptable and being able to iterate and customer discovery and all these types of tools, again, play across whether you're doing a quote unquote true startup or launching any new idea, the more that corporations can start instilling that culture and skill set into their existing employee. And again, maybe you accelerate that by hiring or, or being more a part of the startup ecosystem to, to learn that the skills faster because it doesn't come natural. It's one thing that we're seeing out there in the marketplace as well. Yeah, I mean, another potential approach, and I haven't seen this either, really. On the venture side, it's a pretty common practice these days to, so once you've made a deal, to arm the founding team with a coach whose yep. job is to kind of develop some of those competencies and help them shore up some of their areas of weakness. I mean, that might be another opportunity where maybe you could get somebody who has that background and isn't necessarily willing to kind of jump full hog into kind of corporate land, but is willing to say, all right, hey, your team is committed to this initiative. We have a couple of people that are internal that are kind of staffed to try to execute on it. They do have a lot of energy. They're hungry. They're curious. They're lacking some of these sort of critical competencies. Let's arm them with startup coach to mm -hmm. try to help shore some of that up. That might be another opportunity as well. Where I've seen it also potentially work is in the area of growth boards or that VC board that kind of iterate with the startup, the internal startup trying to go through it and, and having some folks on that growth board being external with maybe more yeah. domain experience or something like that. Yeah. It's not as hands-on, right? but it's another potential option I've seen out there. That would be great. You know, unfortunately, for the most part, the boards that are like that, that I've seen in a lot of companies we've been interacting with are entirely internal. And they look almost like a, just like a normal steering committee rather than, yeah. than a true sort of objective board. But yeah, I think that's a great, great idea. So what else are you seeing out there that may be interesting to our audience? Anything new or exciting tool-wise, technology-wise, methodology-wise that you're seeing that people should know about? From a technology perspective, everybody's obviously into the data stuff and how do we leverage that and AI and all of those sort of things. I think that there's a lack of understanding to a large degree around what's involved in that. And you know, specifically around you need a lot of training data in order to yeah, exactly. um, make something that's useful. And so I think there's just a lack of just domain expertise, but still overcome that. And I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for less of the disruptive type stuff, but more incremental operational efficiency type of things. Once organizations get better at figuring out, wow, we actually are sitting on mountains of data that we're not doing a great job of sort of leveraging. And as they, especially as they start to move some of these legacy systems, I know we have a lot of clients that are kind of migrating, as, you know, their SAP instances to the cloud, either through, you know, SAP's own stuff or AWS or whatever. I'm sure, you know, Oracle's doing the same thing. A lot of the stuff of kind of getting an in-memory sort of data store where I, now I can do some stuff with that, I think is, is going to be really interesting from an incremental kind of innovation perspective. And I also think that there probably will be some new services that historically product-focused companies might be able to start layering on top of that. On the consulting side, I think that there's a big push towards the reverse. You know, you look at like law firms, you look at accountants, you look at management consulting firms where they've historically been compensated for their smarts and their intelligence and high bill rates and all that kind of stuff, a lot of that stuff's going to get automated. And just in conversations I've had with those kinds of organizations, they are making big pushes towards figuring out what parts of our jobs can be automated, where is it that we're going to continue to provide sort of
sort of legit value that we can command, the kind of prices that we're talking about. And given that sort of reality, you know, is it an 80-20 sort of thing or whatever, how do we reinvent our business models in, in light of that? So that's the stuff that I'm seeing kind of at, at a super high level. I think from a, from a tactical perspective, one of the things that we've been trumpeting for a long time, and I'm starting to see get a little bit more traction is this idea around tactical sort of growth accounting. So managing the, the product once it's out in the world to sort of growth metrics, meaning things like activation rate, retention rate, referral rate, and having a, a much more rapid cadence of iteration around experiments designed to manipulate those. Yeah. So a lot of times I think when people watch something, they think, okay, it's live. Now it's going to either work or not work. And obviously that's not reality. So getting them to commit sort of an iterative cadence and getting them to get outside of some legacy sort of IT approaches that look at like quarterly release cycles, if that, you know, and getting more to like, how do we, maybe not continuous deployment, but something more akin to that, where it's like, we're running experiments on a regular basis. We're treating every batch of users or customers that we're getting in each week or study their behavior very, very closely, supplement quantitative with qualitative kind of interviews to figure out if there are bottlenecks, why, and then be really, really aggressive about that iteration loop. I think there's a lot of opportunity and there's still a lot of ground to kind of be made up in, in those areas just to sort of close the gap between them and how successful startups are kind of running. They just run faster. And so kind of getting out of your own way, I think is going to be a big opportunity for organizations. Well, and the tools and that are coming, becoming much more, not easy to use per se, but they're there when they didn't really have a lot of options to, uh, to True. really dig into that. So I could talk a long time about all this kind of stuff, but unfortunately we're out of time. But if, no worries, yeah. if people want to find out a little bit more about yourself or about digital intent or yeah. uh, the venture fund, uh, what's the best way to find sure. out about you? Yeah, you can follow me at Intentionally. You know, I'm, I, I'm on there fairly often. And then, uh, you know, DIG Intent is the website, uh, dot com or founderequity.com or two other places they can find us. Excellent this was uh, really, really fun. Hey, I really appreciate you being on the show and hopefully we'll have you back on some time in the future talking about new exciting stuff that's going on in your world. Thanks very much for being on the show. Definitely, really appreciate it. That's it for another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. If you want to learn more about our team, our content, our services, check out insideoutside.io or follow us on Twitter at the IO Podcast or at Artinger. Until next time, go out and innovate.